This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. This week, Russ Capper on the road again, interviewing Dr. Mae Jemison, physician, engineer, and a former NASA astronaut, the world's first woman of color in space. They talked about her new mission, leading the 100-year starship. This DARPA initiative aimed at building the tools, the energy, and the technology we need to see another star system by the end of the next 100 years. All that, right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. Today's guest, Dr. Mae Jemison, physician, engineer, and former NASA astronaut. In fact, the first woman of color to go into space. Russ Capper caught up with Dr. Jemison earlier at the announcement of her new mission. And we entered the discussion where Russ asked Dr. Jemison to tell us all about it. All right, well, we have to start with that first mission in space of a woman of color. Tell us about that. What was that like? Well, you know what? I have to start a little bit differently. I have to start and say that when I was a little girl growing up during the Apollo era, I assumed that I would go into space. <laughs> and I went on and did a whole bunch of other things before I got to the astronaut program. I joined the astronaut program because I wanted to go into space. The mission I did was with the Japanese Space Agency. It was called um, Space Lab J, and we carried up a laboratory with us. I was a science mission specialist, which meant that I was responsible for as much of the science on board as possible, and I was the representative of the um, primary researchers who were on the ground. And we did experiments ranging from looking at semiconductor materials and how you could make them in weightlessness to um, how the human body responds to weightlessness, and including taking up a project with uh, adult female frogs that we caused to shed eggs. And we watched the growth and development of tadpoles. Why was that important? Is because if we ever are going to be in space for long periods of time, we have to figure out how animals reproduce and grow. But when you were there and you were doing these projects, I mean, was it was it easy to, to focus on the project when you know you could walk over and look out the window or fly over and look out the window and see where you were? So that's the reason why I told you about all the training that's necessary okay. because you train to do this. And so, yes, you're excited and you look out the window whenever you can, but you have a task to do. And that task is to make sure that you get these experiments done, that you use this opportunity in weightlessness to find out so many things about the world. So it wasn't difficult because the experiments in themselves were exciting. Um, I had some great views out the window, though. I mean, I saw Chicago, my hometown. Okay. Uh, that was the first thing I saw when I got into space, okay. was Chicago, my hometown. I saw Egypt go past, images that are just embedded in my mind. May, this is just incredible, but you have been selected to lead the 100-year Starship Initiative, and my goodness, is people learn about this more and more. It's very exciting, but what is the 100-year Starship Initiative? The 100-year Starship is an initiative by DARPA to ensure that we have the capability of sending humans to another star system within the next 100 years. DARPA is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They're the Defense Department's premier research right. agency. They're the group that brought us the internet. Right. That's where it was developed, global positioning satellite systems. They do exoskeletons. They do that really cutting edge, bleeding edge research that moves us further, that we're not even thinking, is this really something that's gonna get us there? Right. They were interested in how do we reconnect with that incredible wealth of innovation 
that came out of space exploration or that comes out of grand challenges. So they were concerned that we were maybe are losing that nowadays? Well, they were concerned that there wasn't a push as much. Uh-huh. And actually, there was uh, uh, the fellow who was the head of the, the Tactical Technology Office named, named Dave Nyland. He said he wanted to push this. And so what happened was they created a grant to seed fund an organization a non-governmental organization to ensure human interstellar flight. And I led the group, the team that won the grant and the seed funding. Well, well, congratulations, (laughs) big time. I um, teamed with uh, two two other uh, groups. So the Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence was a prime. Um, it's an organization that I founded named, it af- named after my mother, who was a Chicago public schools teacher for 25 years. So there was a Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence. We teamed with Icarus Interstellar and Foundation for Enterprise Development. Icarus Interstellar is a group of astrophysicists, astronomers, engineers who have been working for the past year and a half on trying to design a theoretical probe to another star system. And Foundation for Enterprise Development is an organization that looks at governance of technological and innovative companies. So it was really exciting to get this group together. And the thing I can say is that um, it was a very short process for the seed funding uh, grant proposal. And when we got it, we were like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do now? <laughs> I got this. I, I would okay. say that we were, um, we were both excited yeah. and sobered well, by the confidence that DARPA placed in us. But no matter what kind of technology you all come up with, it still is like a trip that might take a decade or something. It's a challenge that uh, we can't do with our current technology, right. our current space technology. It would take 70,000 years to get there using the same kind of technology that's propelling Voyager, which is the furthest way from us okay. of any uh, object made by humans. Okay. So one of the fundamental issues is energy. Right. Because clearly you need to go faster and get there before 70,000 years. Right. right. And energy for propulsion, energy for the distance, the time when you're in inter- interstellar space, when you arrive, you don't really know what energy you have. So you have to find these incredible energy sources. What kind of energy sources? Right now, Voyager's a chemical rocket. We know the chemical's not gonna work. The shuttle's chemical. We know that's not right. gonna work. So we have to look at things like ion propulsion, which comes from nuclear energy. Right. Fission, where you actually tear atoms apart. You can look at things like fusion energy, which is very new to us in some ways, but it's older than humanity itself because that's what our sun runs on. And the next great thing would be antimatter, right? So how when matter and antimatter meet, it creates an incredible, the most powerful energy that we know of in our physical universe. So we want to be able to look at that. And if we just go to a small way of generating these types of energy, controlling it, storing it, then we will fundamentally start to change energy production here on Earth. Oh, well, absolutely. But my goodness, this mission, May, it sounds overwhelming. Uh, I guess you have a long time to get it done, but whoo, you know. Well, there are lots of different pieces. So you can figure out the energy equation, but you also have to figure out the ecosystem, right? Right. Because you're going to have to carry everything that you think you're going to drink, eat, right. or need, or breathe with you because you don't know if you're going to get it from other places. We can start to understand, are there things in interstellar space that are there things that we can utilize, but we don't know that now. All right, so that's even maybe the asteroid mining plays a role? So asteroid mining could be incredibly important because you're looking at construction, right? Right. How do you do this mining in in space? You can come up with the materials, right? Right. Some of the the ideas are you can come up with the materials to build your, your ship, manufacture it in space. So asteroid mining is one of those fundamental pieces. It also helps us to start understanding how space impacts our economy. So while asteroid mining talks about bringing back materials to Earth, we're talking about creating net present value kind of (laughs) calculations based on when I we actually make it to another star when we're, wow, um, you know, two light years from Earth. Right. Well, I mean, even the the whole psychological study and and requirements are going to be uh, beyond anything that we've ever done so far. I think what it does is it pushes us to think about ourselves from a different perspective. 
And that's what's important for moving us forward. We know in the energy industry that eventually we have to figure out different mechanisms. Right. What's going to happen in the future. Right. As humans on this planet, we have to figure out how do we interact with each other while at the same time affording each group of people the ability to improve their quality of life. Those are all things that we fundamentally have to face. And trying to reach a grand challenge like going to another star encompasses all of them. Now, May, I know this is brand new, the announcement of your position, and, and really the whole initiative is, what sort of step one in, in getting word out and getting some momentum going? Our first step exactly is getting word out. The first thing we're doing is we're actually holding a symposium in Houston from September 13th through 16th at the Hyatt. Um, it's, a, it's a public symposium. It's going to have technical papers and technical tracks ranging from you know sociology and habitats to advanced magnetic radiation shielding to fusion energy. Some people are going to talk about warp drive maybe. But we're also going to <laughs> an have avatar. It, and know? we're not talking about avatar. <laughs> no, right. we might. We might. Right. We might because we will have actually uh, classes that deal with um, things ranging from faster than light travel to you know s uh, solar system 101 to I really want to draw pretty space pictures. Right. Will be an expo where right. we will, and I want to invite some of the, the the folks who are listening. We'll have expos for the companies to display the kinds of work they do that we are, in, are able to engage cool. with children and students as well as all the kinds of people who will be there who are involved in space exploration. And we'll have very special events as well, including a celebration and a salute to the 50th anniversary of Kennedy, President Kennedy's speech of sending a man to the moon. The one at Rice University, The right? one at Rice University oh, cool. and Johnson Space Center's 50th anniversary. Cool. So we have a lot of different projects going on at the symposium. We need sponsors. We need people to come and participate. We hope that people will sign up for the symposium and uh, come and spend the weekend with us or come and bring their family. Ooh. We want companies to sponsor exhibits and to sponsor some of the projects uh, down the way even after the expo. Well, it seems like energy companies might be fairly suitable. I think energy companies are extremely suitable because yeah. I think I just said it. Yeah. This is really fundamentally gonna be about energy in really big ways. How people can get involved, go to 100YSS, 100YSS.org. That's 100yearsstarship.org. There's a, uh, a tab that says 2012 Symposium. Okay. May, I really appreciate you uh, sharing this story with us here on the Energy Makers Show. I'm excited about it. Thank you, Russ. Well, that wraps this episode of the Energy Makers, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson. I'll see you next week.